Well, it's over. With the release of Aquaman The Lost Kingdom at the end of 2023, the DCEU, DC Extended Universe, is officially done. And listen, I've said a lot of negative things about the DCEU over the last, uh, oh god, 10 years? So I wanted to take some time to talk specifically about what I think worked. I'm gonna go movie by movie, all the way from Man of Steel to Aquaman 2. And since that is such a long list, I'm splitting this video into three parts. So let's get started with... Now is as good a time as any to acknowledge the elephant in the room, Zack Snyder, a director and producer who I've talked about many times before. So to begin this video, I want to say some positive things about Zack, besides the fact that he seems like a nice guy. Things specifically about his movies, because there's a few of them I quite like. I'll be the first to admit, I loved 300 when it came out. It became, for a few weeks, my friends and I's whole deal. And we weren't alone. Try to say this is madness in 2006 without every 20-year-old guy in a five-mile radius screaming, this is Sparta. Looking back, yeah, the politics of the story are bananas. And before you say, why does it have to be political? I wouldn't agree with that argument if this were a movie about race car drivers or chickens or whatever, but I extra don't think you can detach the political message from a story about a king with certain ideas about how his civilization should be ruled. That's not the point. Because all all that being said, I think 300 shows off Zack's biggest two strengths, cinematography and casting. 300 looks incredible. The speed up slow down effect was used perfectly to accentuate specific, particularly iconic movements. The bronze sepia aesthetic really ties all these unbelievable elements together in a way that feels real. And beyond that, it looks like it jumped right off the page, one to one. Well, I don't think it's the best adaptation ever made, 300 very well may be the most visually faithful. And this is happening in an era where the X-Men are dressed like characters from the Matrix because the director doesn't think comic books look good on screen. So I really respect what Zack was able to accomplish with 300. Then Watchmen. It's been talked to death. Yes, he's doing something different when it comes to the media revolving around heroes, satirizing movies like Batman and Robin instead of Golden Age comics. And yes, the focus on hyperviolence does sort of go against the comics whole deal. That point has been made many times and I largely agree. That being said, for what has, for decades, been described as an unfilmable movie, Zack managed to put together a surprisingly coherent story that again, like 300, managed to win on bold iconography and absolutely flawless casting. And I know Zack doesn't personally cast every actor. 300 was cast by Carrie Hilton, who died here after the movie was released, and Watchmen was cast by Christy Carlson, who would go on to cast nearly every Zack Snyder movie, with the exception of Army of the Dead for some reason. But Carlson, clearly works very well with Zack, which is especially important when a director is so involved in the overall cinematic universe. Think about it. In 300, they managed to bring Gerard Butler into such a memorable position that after 300, he was immediately established as one of Hollywood's big action stars. And I think he gave his second best performance in 300, besides that Greenland movie, that is shockingly good. 300 was also a breakthrough moment for Game of Thrones' as Lena Headey, and everyone always forgets Magneto himself, Michael Fassbender. Then, with Watchmen, you get two picture-perfect performances from Jackie Earl Haley as Rorschach and Jeffrey Dean Morgan as the comedian, along with not as iconic, but still very resonant versions of Night Owl 2 from Patrick Wilson and Dr. Manhattan from Billy Crudup. I don't know if Zack is exactly what I'd call an actor's director, but he's definitely able to pull iconic performances out of these comic book movies, and the people he works with seem to really like working with him. And then both of these movies, 300 and Watchmen, have a real visual intention. Is it subtle? No, but it's effective. It's why Zack Snyder movies tend to make awesome trailers. The imagery from 300 of Leonidas kicking the messenger down the well, or the shot from Watchmen of the comedian being tossed through a window stays with you. And yes, a lot of it is just because of the strength of the visuals in the comics from Frank Miller, Lynn Varley, Alan Moore, and Dave Gibbons, but Snyder has a particular talent for translating those images effectively. It's it's not easy. So yeah, calling Zack Snyder an auteur feels like a bit much, but he was a man with a vision. So bringing him on to start this cinematic universe was a choice. One that informed the DCEU as much as Favreau's humor in Iron Man informed the rest of the MCU. Maybe more. This universe, at least in the beginning, was Zack Snyder's vision. And that was a bold move. So let's talk about... Man of Steel is a movie I've criticized many times before. So, let's just focus on some strengths. The score by Hans Zimmer is incredible. Flight is so emotionally evocative, it gets your blood flowing, makes you feel strong. The original Superman movie's tagline was very famously, 
you will believe a man can fly. A music like this delivers on that premise. I honestly think the DCEU peaked musically here. Not because the rest wasn't good, but because this was great. I will never understand why this theme did not punctuate every big Superman moment going forward. Like, there are a lot of strange choices in Justice League, but how is the big Superman entrance not just eating this track up? Like, what are you doing? Why are we even here? Casting in Man of Steel, also very strong. Let's skip the big guy for a second. Michael Shannon is so intense in this movie. He's bringing exactly the right energy to seem like the same character as Terran Stamp played in Superman 2, while also feeling like something completely new. Rest of the villains, Feora, played by Antia Traue. And this guy, Jaxer, played by Mackenzie Gray. Good, weird little guy. Then, good guys. I mean, Diane Lane and Kevin Costner were terrific Kent parents. Ignoring some of those characters' choices, the characterization was right on. Lawrence Fishburne was a pretty fun Perry White. I loved Christopher Maloney's Colonel Hardy, especially this line. Shall I tell the general you're unwilling to comply? I don't care what you tell him. And then the Pope's exorcist, Russell Crowe, is always a treat. Then Amy Adams. Now say what you will about the role she actually played in the movies. Yes, her story wasn't always incredibly significant. More in the movie we're going to talk about next. But the alien stories frequently seem to lose Lois along the way. And say what you will about the red hair being an unusual look for Lois. But still, Amy Adams captured Lois's pluck pretty perfectly. And I did believe her romance with Clark. And then Cavill. Okay, so first of all, I mean, he looks perfect. Like, right off the page. The face, the body, the voice was solid, especially considering Cavill's British. He sold it. I think he handled the emotion in Man of Steel very well. He had a very stoic posture for the first two-thirds that could read as grim or wooden if it wasn't for the third act where it broke and he felt way more vulnerable. Also, this costume. A choice. I am pro shorts as they come, but things like the giant emblem really worked for me. And then the action was pretty spectacular. Some of the best super speed put to film before or since. Say what you will about where the fight took place, but the visuals and the final battle between Clark and Zod felt like they came right off the page in a comic book. It was clear that this universe was not going to hold back. Superman is doing the flying punching, flying punching move in movie one. I loved the look of the heat vision, and all this 9-11 stuff was something. Some small things I really appreciate in this movie in no particular order. Clark catching the pilot and asking if he's okay. Then later Colonel Hardy saying this man is not our enemy. Good moment. Again, Christopher Maloney, just overall great stuff. Loved the look the soldier gives him in that last scene. Like that little smile. This opening rescue on the oil rig? Okay. The entire ending fight scene was excellent. This line. Where did you train? On a farm? When Namek tosses a train at Clark. I love Zod's little gorilla run. Russell Crowe doing Kryptonian karate. Good. Thought the liquid metal displays were interesting. Like the Lois outfit. Just put together enough to feel like a look without feeling like a costume. I like this look that Perry gives Jenny. I love that Jenny won't go to a basketball game with Lombard even after he risked his life to save hers. Love this line. Can I just keep pretending I'm your son? You are my son. Like this exchange a lot between Clark and Ma Kent. Some really fun product placement. Loved how Clark did the hover fly right off the ground. And then welcome to the planet is a fun line. Yeah, listen, it holds up pretty well. It's Superman, so it's been talked to death and pulled apart by everyone, including me. But that's only because Superman means so much to so many people. He is debatably the most significant popular culture figure in all of American history. So a movie about Superman is going to draw heat that you wouldn't get from, say, an Ant-Man movie. Got all that considered, Man of Steel was a solid foundation for this universe. Whether or not they build a house wall on that foundation is another story, but I don't think it's the foundation's fault. Speaking of that... Okay, listen, I think Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice has a few problems that all stem from the film's cardinal sin, the rush. They rushed killing Superman. They rushed introducing all the Justice League. They rushed introducing the new gods. It was clear that at this point Warner Brothers was trying to catch up to Marvel, who in 2016 was releasing their third Captain America movie that followed their second Avengers movie. I understand the impulse to get your Avengers out there quickly, but I wish they took their time because a lot of the pieces in Batman v Superman were terrific. This opening scene is breathtaking. And the idea of showing the finale of the last movie from the ground level, mwah, perfect. Does it make sense? Should Bruce need to call this guy and tell him to leave during the alien invasion? Probably not. When I used to work in an office building, the second I heard the fire alarm, I was out. No question. But not these guys. Whatever. But this scene set the stage perfectly. Like, since we invoked the name of Marvel, Civil War comes out the same year and is largely about the same thing. The political questions dealing with superheroes living and fighting in the real world. Who do they answer to? Whose fault is the collateral damage? And what happens when someone affected by their ass-kicking comes for revenge? Nothing in Civil War sold that 
idea, as hard as this scene. I mean, hell, Civil War cuts right as the collateral damage from the Lagos fight is starting. We don't see people dying, Cat performing CPR on some kid who got crushed by debris, because if they did, the movie would really need to wrestle with those questions instead of dropping them to focus on Bucky. But imagine the Sokovia fight, but with Zemo running down the street trying to find his family. That is a winner. And then Ben Affleck. I had my doubts initially, and I didn't love everything about this character, but Ben outperformed my expectations. He was a very specific kind of Batman. Not quite Dark Knight Returns, but on the way. But looking back, after five or so appearances, he really settled into the role nicely. I also think this costume is probably the best live-action Batman costume. Ironhead Studios did a phenomenal job. The cowl, the texture, and the logo. All of them work. And then this power armor also looked great, right out of the comic. I also loved Jeremy Irons' Alfred. He captured the caring sarcasm beautifully. And man, I just really like him and stuff, like Watchmen and Margin Call and the bad Dungeons and Dragons movie. Jeremy Irons is very good. Batman v Superman is also where we'd first meet Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman, although I'm going to save most of my praise for her when I talk about her solo movie. And that's it. No other new characters introduced in this one. Just kidding. Wallace Keefe was in it. And Jesse Eisenberg's Lex Luthor. Which, listen, it doesn't work, but it's a choice. So, you know, whatever. Other things about Batman v Superman, the warehouse fight is great. Yes, he's probably killing some of those goons, but just looking at the choreography and the fluidity of Batman's combat, I'd say it's the first time a live action Batman fought and was photographed like he fights in the comics. No disrespect to Bale, but those fight scenes don't hold up. I love the moment where Perry lets Lois have the helicopter because he kinda knows about the Clark thing. I think some of the line reads in this movie are great. You're not brave. Turkish Airlines became very funny product placement. Some of the visuals in the fight with Doomsday were excellent. This one shot of Batman watching the fight from a little bit further away is so cool. And everything Wonder Woman does in this scene is terrific. Love the weird fake eggs Clark is cooking in that scene with Lois. I think a lot of the iconography of Clark saving people in the beginning of the movie is really effective. And I think again, Henry Cavill, pretty good in this. I assume the direction he was given was cold and distant in a lot of these moments, and I think they worked. Holly Hunter was in the movie. Lex Luthor's stuff in that Jolly Rancher to that guy's mouth, wonderful. The fact that KG Beast was technically in one of these movies, that's fun. I think the Batmobile looked awesome. Not a humongous fan of the guns, but just the car itself, terrific. It's got the right mix of feeling like a real physical vehicle while also being just futuristic enough to be able to do anything. Same goes for the Batwing. This shot where Batman dodges Doomsday, loved it. Again, I think Batman v Superman had plenty of faults. A lot of them seem like the kind of notes that would come from the studio level. Have Diana watch the little trailers for all the characters in the future. But it's a shame because a lot of these pieces could have worked. Now that we've done a Superman movie and a Batman movie, time for the logical next step in this universe. Suicide Squad is going to be a quick one. Nah, you know what? Let's look at three things. And that's not including the memes. Because man, every line of this movie is iconic whether it wants to be or not. Here comes Slipknot, the man who can climb anything. What, we some kind of suicide squad? Listen, you are my guests to this handsome hunka hunka. This is Katana. She's got my back. She can cut all you in half with one sword stroke, just like mowing the lawn. Now that's killer out. But the three things that are good, Harley Quinn. This performance was so good it was able to will two sequels to this movie nobody liked into existence because everybody loved this Harley. And Margot was perfect. Besides looking and sounding exactly like the character should, Margot was an incredibly physical actor and turned Harley into a piece of acrobatic art. The characterization in this movie also felt like turning a corner with the character. While the comics had been there for a while, the idea of Harley being Joker's abused ex taking control of her destiny felt like the heart of this character and it really connected with audiences. I think Margot will go down alongside guys like Reeve Superman and Jackman Wolverine as some of the best pieces of comic book casting in history. Number two, Amanda Waller. This performance is so good it seems like it's going to survive the universe reset and it looks like she'll be the only character not originally from Guns the Suicide Squad or later that makes it into the new DCU. And Viola Davis did not need this. In 2016, she turned in an Oscar-winning performance in Fences and was the star of How to Get Away with Murder, one of the biggest shows on TV. She could have phoned this in, or tabletted it in. Instead, Davis turned in an absolutely stellar performance as Amanda Waller. Fully committed, the perfect balance of cold and calculating. 
As much as I love CCH Pounder's version from JLU, Davis's Waller might be the best version of this character put to screen and another one of the best pieces of comic book casting of all time. And then you've got the Captain. I've been a Captain Boomerang fan for as long as I can remember. I love a gimmick, and nobody commits to a dumb gimmick quite like Digger Harkness. So when I heard Boomer was going to play a role in this movie, I was excited but a little nervous. Would they go full Boomerang or would they, oh I don't know, ditch the Boomerangs for a shotgun? So I was delighted to see Captain Boomerang throw some Boomerangs. And beyond on that, I'd love Jai Courtney's Captain Boomerang because he sucked. He was a real piece of work. An actor with more ego could have pushed for Boomer to actually be a decent guy, take the anti out of anti-hero so that the actor can maintain some sense of likability. And that is not what they did with Digger. He was dirty, he was dumb, and he was bad. Not evil, but not good. And I really respect that decision. And one more thing. The movie did win an Oscar. And listen, did it deserve the Oscar? No. But were the makeup and hairstyle very good? Sure, better than, say, Star Trek Beyond, or even the Nice Guys, or Hail Caesar, or Eddie the Eagle. No, it is pretty good, some of it. And the costumes, Deadshot with a mask, Boomerang's coat, Harley's hair, Katana, they all looked very solid. So yeah, I think there's a strong case to be made that this is the weakest DCEU movie, but it sets a few things in motion that would pay off big time. The DCEU is in a rough place, with two underperformers in a row. They needed a home run to keep this universe alive. Enter. Let's start with the easy one. Wonder Woman is the only movie in this phase besides Man of Steel that felt like it came out at the right time. Batman needed a solo movie before Batman v Superman. Aquaman and Flash needed solos before Justice League. But thank God Wonder Woman showed up where it did. Otherwise, the rush would have felt 100 times worse and they would have skipped from Suicide Squad directly into Justice League. And the decision to make this movie a period piece was smart. It was clear that they were following the Captain America playbook, but it made sense. It didn't disrupt the canon and gave us an opportunity to see more of this world. And seeing the world was a good thing. The Themyscira scenes were great. Their civilization felt real. The costuming was terrific. Everything about the Amazons worked, including the cast. Connie Nelson as Hippolyta and Robin Wright as Antiope set the tone really well. And even though looks-wise I got these two confused a lot the first time I saw it, their vibes were very distinct. They helped to support Gal. Now let's talk about her. Forgetting about politics or role in future movies or anything like that, just looking at Batman v Superman Man and Wonder Woman. Gal Gadot met the moment. This movie meant a lot to people, and if Diana didn't work, it would have been borderline unwatchable. So much of Wonder Woman hinged on Diana's charm. She needed to feel strong yet vulnerable. She needed to be smart yet naive. She needed to be kind yet brutal. And when you look at Gal's record before Batman v Superman, you can see how this could fail. Her big credit before this was Giselle in the Fast and Furious movies, a character that was fine but didn't strike you as capable of leading a hundred million dollar blockbuster. But she brought it. Gal's Diana felt incredibly powerful. I'm sure a lot of that comes from the direction of Patty Jenkins, and sure, the big action scenes were iconic, but those little moments, Diana and Steve walking around London, or Diana sneaking into the ball to talk to the general, those also gave Diana an appropriately otherworldly spirit. And yet, she was relatable. I think moments like Diana discovering ice cream or trying on clothes did a lot to ground this character. That's kind of stuff Marvel's always been excellent at, small character building moments between big fight scenes. And I think the pace of Wonder Woman was able to sustain a good balance between both. Then the other genius move. Chris Pine basically played Chris Pine in this, and sometimes that is all you need. He's one of the most versatile of the Hollywood Chrises, able to pull off a standard action hero without losing his humanity. And I think Pine's Steve Trevor was the perfect pairing for Diana. He was sarcastic, but not annoying. Realistic, but not cynical. And his romance with Gal really played. And these two were pretty much the movie. I will say, I liked Edda, although we didn't really get enough time with her for the friendship to develop. It's a shame because giving Diana a friend who's just another other person would have helped to develop a new perspective for Diana, but these movies can only be so long. I get it. Speaking of supporting characters, I also think Gal had terrific chemistry with Ben in Batman v Superman. That scene where they flirted felt right off the page. Also can't forget, the Wonder Woman costume was phenomenal. She's always had a tricky costume to pull off in live action. Don't believe me? Ask the Amazon pilot. But striking the right balance between function and spectacle was key, and Michael Wilkinson knocked it out of the park. It was such a good design that it more or less stayed with Diana throughout the rest of her DCEU run. Sure, they lost some straps and brightened some colors, but the core costume was always the same. Speaking of adaptational changes, the way Diana's powers were integrated into the world was natural. She could have just carried a shield and sword, but Diana also fought using the Lasso of Truth and her bracers based on the classic bracelets of submission, and both felt like they belonged alongside the rest of her Amazonian arsenal. One note for the future, while I like the lasso effects during fights, it is cool to see Diana just coil the lasso when she's done. It sort of turned into 
into a tendril that just snapped back at the end of action, but giving it that moment to turn back into a physical object with weight and tension does a lot to ground the action. And the action scene on the World War I battlefield was electric. Obviously, that one shot from the AMC Nicole Kidman video really stuck around, but all the fighting during that was excellent. Especially loved this shot from Steve Trevor's POV. Helps to really hammer home how unreal all of this is. Also, I want to take a second to talk directly to Alan Feinberg, Zack Snyder, and Jason Fuchs, who all have story buy credits on Wonder Woman, and specifically Alan, who has the sole screenplay buy credit. Wonder Woman goes into what has been very clearly identified as no man's land, and Steve says, This is no man's land, Diana. It means no man can cross it, all right? Thank you, Alan, Zach, Jason, and director Patty Jenkins for summoning a Herculean amount of restraint and not having Diana say, I am no man, right before she climbs up. Just thank you. I also love how grimy World War I looked. It was truly horrific, and they didn't stray away from that to turn this into a rosy action movie. That scene in the trench is rough. One thing I should mention, I'm not a huge fan of the Wonder Woman tune, but I know people like it. I think the part I don't like specifically is the electric cello. It works here and did Batman v Superman, but it always feels so out of place when it drops into another movie like Fury of the Gods or Flash. But overall, people loved this movie. It had an incredible amount of goodwill, but also a ton of baggage. It needed to be the first big superhero movie with a woman in the lead role. And you know if it bombed, executives would have gotten worried about other projects starring women, citing Wonder Woman's failure, the same way people brought up Catwoman and Elektra in the 2000s. But Wonder Woman delivered. It saved the DCEU from collapsing under the weight of the rush, and gave everyone hope that this could all work out. Until... So I am going to try to hold on to many of my positives here, and save them for the segment on Zack Snyder's Justice League in a little bit. But... I do want to highlight a couple of moments in Justice League, the 2017 version, rewritten and reshot partially by Joss Whedon, that I did like which did not make it into Zack Snyder's Justice League. First one, I love the save one exchange. This is the kind of thing Joss writes really well. Somewhat deconstructions where a character questions the nature of the supernatural story elements and a more seasoned character teaches them a lesson. This scene does not make any sense in context with the Flash movie since Barry has saved people before, but this idea that Batman is able to bring out the best in the team is kind of the heart of this movie, so I think the exchange really works. Second, and this is going to be incredibly controversial, I think this Superman intro is better. Sometimes I'm a sucker for core setup lines and I think Superman coming back with a line about truth and justice is much stronger than just the word unimpressed. It's a personal thing, but I see why they made that change. Also, I love the Superman suit. I understand why they went with the black suit, but I think this red and blue suit is probably the best looking Superman suit since Christopher Reeve. It's everything I like about the Man of Steel suit with bolder colors. Also, I like the line where Cyborg and Superman pull the mother boxes apart. Not as much the toes joke, that is very Whedon-y, but the moment where they both agree that they like being alive. That's a good moment. I also really like the bit where Superman is holding the building, and yes, it's silly looking, but also, as we all know, the bioelectric field is keeping the building together so it holds up. And the post-credits bit where Flash and Superman race is good. I mean, brunch? What even is brunch? Just kidding, that's a bad joke from five years before the movie came out. But the idea that Superman and Flash would race is fun. Also, this cyborg costume for the very end of the movie? Great. Best one we've seen in the movies. And I will never not love the fact that Superman's face looks like this for most of the movie. It might be the funniest bit of studio pettiness in history. I doubt anyone will be watching this version of the movie in 20 years, but I would love to be someone who didn't know anything about the mustache situation, trying to figure out why Superman looks like he just had kind of a stroke. But yeah, this movie is just sort of okay, and really falls apart when you compare certain moments to Zack Snyder's Justice League, but there are little flashes of heart in Justice League that I cannot deny. Speaking of undeniable... This is an easy one, since Aquaman made a billion dollars. Don't really need to defend it, but let's go over the basics. What do I need to say that is not covered by the sentence? At exactly 1 hour and 33 seconds into Aquaman 1, an octopus plays the drums. You cannot watch a movie where that happens and not have at least a little fun. And after Justice League, that's what this universe needed. A movie that was fun. It could be plenty of other things too, but when it came to plot, or dialogue, or aesthetic, it was clear that everything was concerned with having fun. Now, I'll never not think that Jason Momoa was a bizarre choice for Aquaman, considering the look, which I'm not as concerned about, but more importantly, the vibe of the character in almost all other media. Comics, TV shows, games, and sure, actors have range. They don't need to play the same character in every project, but based off Jason's non-Game of Thrones roles and his off-screen persona, it felt like he'd make 
make more sense is, oh, I don't know, Lobo. And yet, Momoa's new take on Aquaman worked for this movie. His energy felt incredibly fresh, since even the movies that worked, like Man of Steel or Wonder Woman, featured protagonists who took things very seriously. Momoa's Arthur Curry was able to play things a little sillier, more relatable, and it went a long way to make this story accessible, which was important because Atlantis was the most extreme looking world so far in the DCEU. Supporting cast was also excellent. Looking back, Patrick Wilson was probably the MVP. He didn't need to do anything all that different from other theatrical yet dangerous villains that came before him like Loki or Magneto, but his intensity was able to match Momoa's, which is no easy feat. I also think Amber Heard deserves a lot of praise here. She had the thankless job of explaining everything to Arthur. Also, she ate that flower, that was funny. Willem Dafoe was in this one, and he had one of my favorite line reads in all of the DCEU. The king is risen. Also, Julie Andrews made it in this as the Carathan, which is funny for a few reasons. It's one of those roles where she basically did it because her grandkids told her to. She also doesn't know what the Carathan is. Like, I'm always impressed when someone, say like Dolph Lundgren, seems to know how the comic versions of King Nereus and the Kingdom of Zebel have gone through lots of changes, but I also love it when an actor goes, I don't know, I think I was the squid thing. But the thing I'll never forget, this movie opened against Mary Poppins Returns, and Julie Andrews, Mary Poppins herself does not even have a cameo in that movie, but she's an Aquaman. It feels like the real genius here was James Wan. The more I learn about this movie, the more I want Wan to direct 50 of these. Like, give him Spider-Man, or Batman, or Swamp Thing, or X-Men, because the action in Aquaman is impressively ambitious, and that isn't even taking account how they needed to invent new ways to film underwater scenes. But just based off the stuff on land, the choreography, the energy, if you had asked me to explain why this movie hit so hard, it seems like this. Scenes that won't go down is the greatest action scene in comic book movies movie history, but are thrilling and technically challenging. And the one technical issue I do want to focus on is the sets. The amount of things they built for this movie is extraordinary. Like, they built this sunken ship and this submarine set that could be fully submerged underwater. They built this bar. They just couldn't find a bar they liked in Australia, so they built one that locals thought was just a new bar. They planned to film this fight scene in the Sicilian town of Erice, but the town changed their mind, so Warner Brothers just built the town. So much work went into making Aquaman look real. As real as a movie like this can, and it shows. They invented a new kind of paint to make Aquaman's armor so that it would shine and be flexible while covered in water. They came up with a new technology to render everyone hair. And all this was done in service of making an Aquaman movie that captures the spirit of the comics. Looking back, Aquaman's success might not make sense immediately. How is Aquaman, the DC movie that breaks a billion dollars worldwide? The movie where Mira and Aquaman are stranded in the desert and they look at a map of Sicily and then they're in Sicily. Or the movie where they get out of the water in slow motion to a Pitbull song. And you can give credit to everyone. But above all else, it is impossible to deny that this movie looks spectacular. And when you compare it to other live-action huge blockbuster superhero movies, it might be the best looking one ever made. And that counts for a lot. And that was it. Sure, there were a couple of stumbles, but by the end of 2018, the DC Extended Universe had a few huge hits and a team of heroes played by international superstars. So now it was up to DC to do the hard part. Keep moving forward. And hopefully... There wouldn't be a humongous world event in the next year or two that could derail everything. Next video, we are starting with Shazam and going all the way to Peacemaker in what might be the best stretch of these DC movies, period. If you want to watch that right now, you can find my next video up early on this video's sponsor, Nebula. That's right, part two, Dawn of James Gunn, is up right now. And if you're watching this video in like a month and that next video is already on YouTube, then guess what? Whatever my next video is, is on Nebula. There's a card on screen that takes you to my next video. So follow that, see what you have to look forward to. Nebula is a creator created subscription streaming platform where we are free to do whatever we want. That means everything is ad free, videos go up early, my other channel, The Nando Cut, is up there now too, and Nebula is where we've got all of our exclusive stuff. So Patrick's feature length movie that I am in very briefly. There I am. You see it? Lindsay Ellis just released a documentary on John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Jesse Gender's new movie, Identities, is going to Nebula. It's where all the cool stuff goes. I've got some older videos that are only on Nebula fan casting some obscure X-Men. Might do a couple more of those once I'm finished with this series. And a subscription to Nebula is super affordable. It's $50 a year. 
But with the code NANDO, N-A-N-D-O, you get a year of Nebula for just under $2.50 a month. It's an incredible deal. Go to Nebula, look around. I'm sure you'll find something you like. And I will see you for part two, hopefully, very soon. Besides that, thank you to everybody that continues to support the channel on Patreon, everybody that listens to my podcast, Mostly Nitpicking, everybody on the Nando V Movies Discord server, everybody that watches the Nando Cut videos, and everybody that follows me on Twitter. That's all I got. Stay safe. I'll see you next time.